so my name is Mukobe Masuta and I am particularly excited to join SASCO's series of public lectures on higher education. As a former member of SASCO and a former chairperson of a branch of SASCO, I'm particularly honored to be invited to, to take part in these discussions during the lockdown. I want to also thank the National Executive Committee of SASCO for inviting me and to greet all structures of SASCO across the country in both universities and TVET colleges. But before I start, during these uh, uncertain times, I think it's only logical that we thank our healthcare workers, our security personnel, and everybody who is at the forefront of fighting this particular pandemic. Now, primarily I've been asked to reflect on challenges of a continued commodification of higher education in South Africa. But SASCO went beyond that. They also asked me to address very specific questions about how we deal with the historic debt, number one. Two, how we deal with the constant fear that government's higher education policy might be reversed at some point. Some are even uh, concerned that uh, COVID-19 may become the reason or the justification for those who believe free higher education is a costly exercise that should not uh, continue. Uh, the last thing that SASCO requested me to speak on is what should a free higher education policy model look like in a post-COVID-19 South Africa? On the basis of this uh, request, I have decided or thought it is appropriate for me to, to title our conversation Confronting Neoliberalism and the Commodification of Higher Education in South Africa. What is at stake? Now, I chose this particular title because it is my firm view that the continued financial and academic genocide on the educational dreams and aspirations of working class students in South Africa has been an outcome of a neoliberal economic order that has presided over South Africa in the past 25 years and actually turned South Africa into what is effectively the most unequal country in the world today. Though those are the reasons, or that is the main reason why I thought I should title our discussion along those lines. But first, let's start with the structure of our conversation. One, I will start by drawing from the work of Chomsky and others to define what exactly is neoliberalism and what is commodification of higher education. Two, I will reflect on the legacy of neoliberalism in South Africa in the past 25 years of democracy. Three, I will briefly highlight conditions that I believe uh, laid a solid foundation for the higher education funding crisis that we witnessed in 2015, also popularly known as Fees Must Fall. Number four, which is another specific request from SASCO, I'll then focus on the weaknesses of the four known higher education funding models, that is, NSFAS prior to 2015, the Nasana Ministerial Report recommendation and its model, and of course the Judge Heha, uh, Judge Heha Commission recommendations uh, out, or the outcomes of that particular report. And uh, I will end by evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of the current higher education funding uh, policy, which was announced in December 2017. At the end, of this particular evaluation, I will end by making a few recommendations on how I think SASCO can consolidate working class interest on campus and continue to preserve the interests of all students in a particularly hostile uh, higher education uh, sector. Now, to avoid descending into unnecessary jargon, I will structure our presentation in a point form. And I'll, so I will ask a question and try to answer it to avoid being all over the place, because this is obviously a live discussion. So, point number one. For us to understand the impact of neoliberalism and the commodification of higher education uh, in South Africa, we must first define what is neoliberalism and what is commodification. This is important because the terms are subjective, 
and they are also interpreted differently uh, depending on who you are talking to. So, what is neoliberalism? Neoliberalism is basically an ideology or a policy model that advocates for five basic principles on how an economy ought to be run. These five basic principles are 1. Deregulation 2. Privatization 3. Tax reduction 4. Cutting of government spending or welfare and 5. Clipping of the wings of uh, uh, trade unions. Let's start with deregulation. By deregulation, uh, neoliberals argue that barriers must be brought down to allow the free movement of goods, services, people and capital. In other words, big business or the private sector must be allowed to get on with the business of creating wealth with minimal, if any, state intervention. That is what deregulation is. Privatization. By privatization, neoliberals argue that organizations, institutions or entities that are providing or supplying goods and services must be in the hands of, of private entities and not government or the pub public sector. They say this will make them more efficient. It will also help us save on taxes. <clears throat> of course, this includes the transfer of state-owned assets from the public sector to private hands. However, when you hear somebody say, let's privatize a state-owned entity or a state-owned company because it is underperforming or it is inefficient, that's a smokescreen. <clears throat> By virtue of their ideological stance, neoliberals believe state-owned entities should be privatized uh, regardless of whether they are doing well or not. Now, according to Noam Chomsky, when state-owned entities, whether it's providers of goods or services, or just state assets in general, when they are performing at their best or optimal levels, what then happens is that their operational capacity is frustrated and they are also underfunded. And those two, op those two activities are then used to manufacture reasons for privatizing them. Anyway, tax reduction. So instead of governments taxing multinational corporates and the wealthy in order to fund the country's social program or developmental program, neoliberals argue that the tax burden on big business or the private sector in general, must be reduced. They believe that when that happens, it will help the economy grow, it will help big business thrive, and ultimately it will, leave, it will lead to wider economic benefits. In other words, the benefits of the economy will eventually trickle down to everybody. There is no evidence of that happening anywhere in the world. But at least that's the definition. That's what they mean by tax reduction. Number four, obviously, we said cut welfare spending, which is particularly relevant to our discussion. So they advocate for public schooling, you know, private university, I mean, private schools, private universities, private uh, hospitals. I'm sure you have heard people uh, saying that private schools and private hospitals are more efficient than the public ones. Um, however, the truth is that they serve a fewer richer people at a budget ten times that of a public school or a public clinic. Uh, and, and so they appear efficient, but uh, in reality, that's what happens. If you take a, a supposed uh, efficient private school teacher to a grossly under-resourced uh, school in the middle of nowhere, with hardly any resources, his or her efficiency will fly out of the window. And lastly, of course, they believe that uh, you must clip the wings of trade unions. In other words, in, SASCO would be a version of trade union, in this case of students. So the wings must be clipped so that there's less disruption in the functioning of the economy. At least that is what, uh, according to Noam, Ch Noam, uh, Noam Chomsky and others, that is what neoliberalism is. Point number two, the year 2019 marked 25 years since the ANC came into office. That is, that is a deliberate choice of words. I could have said since the ANC came into power, but that would be an inaccurate characterization of what I deem to be power. 
because you see power is not something you possess power is something you exercise so to have power and not exercise it is to not have power at all in fact to have power and not exercise it uh, is worse than uh, not having power at all so being in office and being in power those two very different so in this second point as an economic geographer i want to suggest that before we reflect on the impact of commodification on higher education and before we devise means on how to confront the buying and selling of education which excludes the majority of the working class uh, who happen to be black in this country we must first reflect on what impact has the neoliberal economic order as a macroeconomic policy what impact has it had on south africa in the past 25 years this is important because higher education exists to serve society not the other way around so when we say we are funding higher education in reality we are funding a service to society so we have to understand the character of that society or the status of that society at a given point in order for us to be able to evaluate whether that higher education sector is saving that particular society the right way. So, how does South Africa look 25 years late? I mean, it's 26 now, but let's just use 2019 as a cut-off date for now. Because much of the data that I will rely on uh, was published in 2019. And I will make this available, as I said on my Facebook page, for, for, for comrades to, ref, to reference uh, beyond the debate. To give us a state of South Africa today, I will rely on five sources. One, Statistics South Africa's Inequality Trends Report, published in 2019. Two, Statistics South Africa's uh, National Poverty Lines Report, published in 2018. And uh, the President's 25-year review uh, report, actually published last year, um, around December. Then National Treasury's medium-term budget state, uh, policy statement. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the one which was read out in 2017. And lastly, I will rely on the research of a very, an excellent researcher by the name of Arthur, rather Anna Othofa, uh, who is uh, based at Stellenbosch University. Okay, let's get the status of South Africa briefly because, because of time, I will move fast. And I'll also be in point form. And if there's anything that is not clear, then we can discuss later, which, which I very much look forward to, actually. One. Statistics South Africa's Poverty Lines Report, or National Poverty Lines Report, tells us that out of 57 million South Africans, 56% of them, or 30.4 uh, million of them, live in poverty what does that mean what does living in poverty actually mean because that's a very subjective term but at least according to this particular measure which is globally recognized as a standard it means 30.4 million south africans live on less than 38 rand a day or 1183 rand a month that's the figure for you number two of those who are working about 6.6 .6 million of them and below 3,500 a month. That's according to the presidency's minimum wage report which was published before the minimum wage was actually uh, uh, introduced. Three, income inequality in South Africa, which is particularly more relevant to our discussion again. So, this is the status today. The top 10% earning South Africans take home 65% of the total income, which means the bottom 90% earning South Africans share the remaining 35% of the income. That is income inequality. What is worse is when you go to wealth inequality. The top 10% of South Africans are in possession of 93% of the country's wealth. Wealth includes land, property, and the rest of them. 
which means the bottom 90% South Africans are in possession or are sharing the remaining 7% of the wealth. Uh, this is the image of South Africa today. This is the undisputable legacy of 345 years of white privilege under apartheid and colonial rule and the past 25 years of a failed neoliberal experiment uh, in post-apartheid South Africa. But this is not exclusive to South Africa. This is the legacy of the neoliberal economic order in every country you can think of that has gone this route. It has resulted in the greatest concentration of wealth at the top in the history of mankind. And yet, a recent pamphlet uh, published by National Treasury, specifically Minister uh, Mboweni, suggests that we actually continue in this particular path. Now, the, the, the concentration of wealth which has bred the most unequal patterns uh, in, in human history has, has had dire political ramifications. In fact, it, has, it is largely or partly attributed to the takeover of Europe and North America by right-wingers. Because the liberals are unable to convince society that this neoliberal route will ever get us anywhere, given that it has widened inequality more than any other generation before. Okay? That is the state of our country. That is the legacy or the undisputable legacy or footprint of neoliberal economics in South Africa. Why is this important to reflect on? It's important in this discussion on higher education funding because it is the relationship between the socio-economic profile of South African families and the representation of their children in higher education that will tell us which groups are underrepresented. In other words, which income groups, which race, which gender, uh, and therefore <coughs> which class. Two, when we say pro-poor policies, who must be given free higher education and who must not? This is why to get the picture of South Africa is so critical. Now, <clears throat> keeping in mind the income inequalities we have just referred to above, reflecting on our past is also important uh, for us to avoid treating unequal people equally. Because treating unequal students equally will be the quickest way of reproducing an unequal student population. Basically, that's the reason why. And I believe personally that after 345 years of apartheid and the legacy that neoliberalism has had on our country, it's about time that we adopt and enforce what is known as positive discrimination or redistributive justice. Taking from the wealthy, uh, the opulent, in order to fund the poor and the working class. And as a result of this equation, we will have some degree of equitable collective social mobility moving forward. Okay, point number three. We're getting closer and closer to campus. I thought we must come outside into the university. The fees must fall crisis was an outcome of the ANC government's failure to implement its own long-standing commitment to making higher education free for the poor and the working class. That's the position. Importantly, it is the legitimacy of the state as the final arbiter or authority over policy and practice and the political legitimacy of the African National Congress as the genuine custodian of the hopes and wishes of the poor, that was particularly under threat. That is my firm, my firm opinion. So had decisive state intervention not taken place in December 2017, it is my view that the private sector, and specifically the banking sector, would have successfully subverted government education policy and enslaved this generation and future generations using student loans. That's the position I hold. From the Freedom Charter of 1955 in Cliptown to Polokwane in 2007, 
from Mangaung in 2012 to Nazarek in 2017, the provision of free higher education has been the cornerstone of the ANC government's uh, educational policy, at least higher education policy. Of course, primary school is already free in the main. How, however, despite this long-standing and binding policy commitment, a neoliberal approach to education in post-1994 underpinned the commodification of higher education as something that must be bought and sold. And it is the legacy of that thinking that laid a solid foundation for what became known as fees must fall. That is the view. In other, if, in other words, if you want a short timeline, 2007, we put free education as a policy resolution. In other words, it's binding. It's no longer a person's opinion. In, in Mangaung, we say, finalize the policy in 2013 and uh, implement it in 2014. We don't do that. Fees must fall starts in 2015 in a particularly uh, public way. Of course, it was a continuation of campus protests that had been taking place for as long as I can remember. Okay, point number four. Let's come to the different models, as I said earlier. What was wrong with NSFAS prior to 2015? In other words, prior to Fees Must Fall. What is wrong or what was wrong with the Nasana Ministerial Task Team report? And what is wrong with the recommended model, the income contingency loan recommended model? Accurate in many ways. And I think it was responsible in the main for fueling much more uh, fire than it would have. Firstly, an incapacitated and fairly meritocratic and increasingly commodified sector of higher education ensures that the poor do not even arrive, let alone be taken care of. So you, it couldn't be true. But secondly, that narrative was not backed by institutional and national data. For example, by 2016, NSFAS was only funding about 205,000 students out of almost a million university students. That's about 20% of the overall student population. But if you drill down to some universities, VETS would have been taking about 6,000 students and less than 600 were actually NSFAS funded first years. So NSFAS students who are in the main, well, not in the main, exclusively at the time, children of those earning between 0 and 122,000 annually, remained a minority, particularly in historically elite institutions. The third tragedy of NSFAS was something called, or a practice called, uh, top slicing. <clears throat> now, what is top slicing? Top slicing was a practice whereby NSFAS, in order to reach a much greater number of students, will partially fund uh, certain students. In other words, uh, <clears throat> If the full cost of study was 100,000 rand, you'd be given maybe half of that or 60% of that, you know, regarding, uh, depending on the, on the formula they used. However, top slicing led to something tragic. Because the students who were partially funded ended up owing universities the difference between what NSFAS gave them and what universities and the overall full cost of study charged them which meant they were refused the registration entry the following year because of what was called outstanding balance or what is now known as historic, historic debt. So, before I, I drink, uh, let me finish this point. The debt that students are said to owe universities, that which is now being called historic debt, is not students' debt. It is NSFAS debt to the universities and therefore NSFAS must, must, uh, must pay it. Now, this may sound a little populist, but let me explain a bit further. What you, if you go into the data of NSFAS, you will realize very poor students who would be accepted, sent an SMS or a letter that they have been given NSFAS for this academic year and go and enroll at a university. Halfway through the year, that student is told, you are no longer being funded because NSFAS ran out of money. 
By the time that student finishes the academic year, he or she owes the university 150,000 rand. So you can't possibly say that is a debt that the student must pay because the student has proved that he or she was given confirmation to be funded by NSFAS. That's, that's what I'm referring to. The other one is that <clears throat> it is contradictory to say, okay, uh, okay, students, you have protested, we have heard you, we are now giving you free higher education. But before you access that, can you just pay that 50,000 rand that you owe the university? The 50,000 rand you incurred as a result of NSFAS's past tendencies. It can be correct. Anyway, lastly, and perhaps most importantly when it comes to NSFAS, NSFAS's biggest weakness was a stagnant and outdated definition of who is poor and working class. So as you know, the poor and the working class were defined as young people coming from families, <coughs> households rather, let's use household, because in African families, family can mean something else. Let's use household. Households earning uh, between 0 and 122,000. For almost two decades, that definition of who is poor and working class remained stagnant despite the cost of university having tripled and that of living having tripled. So in fact, the students who are now being called or being confused as missing middle were simply victims of an outdated definition of who is poor and working class which did not keep up with the escalating cost of university and the escalating cost of living. That was the last and I would say the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest weakness of NESFAS, the NESFAS model. There is no mi middle class in South Africa. So the students who were being called missing middle were neither missing nor in the middle of the income uh, stratum. As I indicated above, uh, in South Africa you don't have the middle. You have the bottom 90% who are sharing 7% of the wealth and you've got the top 10% who have got 93% of the wealth. You've got the bottom 90% who are sharing 35% of the total income and you've got the top 10% who are sharing or who are enjoying 65% of the total income. So there is no middle. And I know people talk about the so-called middle, black middle class. I, I think they are a statistically insignificant group of people that shouldn't factor, at least not in this discussion. Let's leave NESFAS and come to the, uh, the NASANA Ministerial Task Team, which was commissioned alongside the protests. While students were protesting, the NASANA Ministerial Task Team, uh, and I call it the NASANA not to personalize it, to Mr. Sizwe Masana, you must not, I don't seek to be personal, but you know how we call commissions in this country, after the chairperson, so Judge Hare Commission, it's not really his commission, but it's named after him, so I don't want to be mis misunderstood. So uh, the Masana Ministerial Task Team <coughs> was nothing short of violence against the working class, basically a crime scene in as far as I'm concerned. A number of things were, were, were wrong with it. And I want to just quickly list them, and then we'll move on to Judge Heha, then we'll move on to the free education policy, uh, its strengths and weaknesses, and then we'll finish with where SASCO should be headed as a vanguard or a, a, a defense force of the working class within a commodified uh, um, uh, higher, higher education. Firstly, the first thing that was wrong with the Nasana Ministerial Task Team was its composition, which constituted uh, nothing short of a a direct conflict of interest. It consisted of representatives from the banking, financial and banking sector. I mean, Banking South Africa, the Association of Savings and Investment in South Africa, which represents APSA, NetBank, InvestTech, and so on, and the, you know, the law firm Weber Wenzel. Uh, and these institutions were somehow direct beneficiaries of the recommendations of the various tax team. That is the, the, the the conflict of interest I'm referring to is not uh, something that's coming out of my head. Number two, the Masana task team, its recommendations amounted to blatant privatization and further commodification of higher education in that it called for NESFAS, the structure, NESFAS, the statutory structure, NESFAS, the publicly owned statutory structure that uh, 
disburses funding to poor and working class students to be replaced by something called ISFAP or Ikusasa Students Financial Aid Program, which was going to be a private entity. So that's blatant uh, uh, privatization uh, under, of course, under the hoax of public-private partnership, which is, you know, if you have listened to Stephen Kosef, you will know that by PPP they mean P. <clears throat> Number three, the task team deviated from ANC policies commit, policy commitment to funding the poor and the working class who are currently grossly underrepresented by suggesting that government's obligation must extend to children of the top 10%, that is all the way up to 600,000 household income, uh, in the form of income contingency loans. We'll come back to that later. For the task team further fragmented the poor and the working class. So you remember we were saying the 0 to 122,000 household income was outdated. The Nasana task team further fragments that group to very poor and poor and working class. Very poor is those who coming from families from 0 to 78,000 and then poor and working class are those coming from uh, families from uh, uh, 78,000 to 150,000. All of them are somehow further handed to bank loans in one way or another, and I'll get to that. <coughs> now, with the, this is, in fact, this is the, let me explain the metrics of the ISFAP model. This is year one, year two, year three, year four. Very poor, poor and working class, lower missing middle, upper missing middle. Very poor. In their first year, grant, second year, grant, third year, grant, last year, loan. Poor and working class, in their first year, grant, second year, grant, third year, partial loan, final year, 100% loan. The so-called uh, lower missing middle, in their first year, grant, second year, partial loan, partial grant, third year, loan, fourth year, loan. The... <coughs> The upper missing middle, loan, 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 loan. That model, as we critiqued it, it kept, change, kept changing uh, and being put on the Mail and Guardian and the likes. But you get that picture. Government money must come in the first year, second years, where the majority of students drop out. And when we are now sure that these students are about to graduate, loans must kick in. The so-called shared risk. Anyway... Then the fifth critique is that ISFAP would have tied both the students and government to lifelong indebtedness plus interest. Sixth and then last critique of that model. In this model, as I explained, bank loans would kick in when we are sure that they are about to graduate. So I don't need to repeat that particular part. But the point I wish to repeat or rather to emphasize is why would government invest millions of rands on a student from birth, early childhood, primary school, secondary school, first year, second year, only to hand over that person to loan sharks when they are about to graduate. There is no government in the world that, that should do something like that. Of course they do. But that should do something like that. Uh, and lastly, the role of the private sector in that report was left to a voluntary nature in the form of issuing government guaranteed uh, loans as well as uh, <coughs> uh, tax exempt donations anyway let's move uh, uh, but before i move something interesting and i quote from that particular report the wish was that <coughs> the loan book of isfap would become so efficient that one day it would be rated by rating agencies and therefore attract more loan sharks to feed into that and then the loans will go to the students the students will default and then government would pay the loan sharks kind of thing anyway let's come to the commission of inquiry by judge Hare, which is uh, the third model <coughs> this commission was a copy and paste of the ministerial task team uh, led by uh, Masana, just west Listen attentively. The, the, the commission recommends that uh, government takes income contingency loans 
Let's rephrase that. Students must receive income contingency loans from commercial banks. And those loans must be guaranteed by the government. And those loans must be extended not to the poor and the working class, not to the so-called so missing middle, but to everybody. All students, undergraduate, postgraduate, in public and private universities and colleges. That escalates the, the, the responsibility of, of government at the time, if you count TVET and universities, from about 400 or so thousand students to, you know, about 1.7 or so million students, if you count private colleges, bogus or not. So, this was the recommendation of the, of the, the commission. The commission recommended that banks must give these loans to the students. If the student drops out, government must pay the banks. If the student graduate and not get a job, like the 5% graduates who are unemployed, government will pay the banks. If the student graduates and get a job that doesn't pay him or her enough to pay the banks, government must pay the bank. And my favorite one, if the students, like some students are doing in the United States, decide to boycott the loan and not pay, like what's happening with Nesfa, sorry as well, then government still must pay the banks. So income contingency loans create the impression that we are not taking money from the student's pocket because if they don't pay or decide to pay or end up being able to pay, we will take the money from government except that government's money is student's money. We'll get to that as well a bit later when we talk politics. Uh, again, just like the Nasana task team, the, the, the HEHA report was a bit more outright with the privatization intention, which was uh, replace NSFAS and the loans must be administered by banks themselves. In fact, on the report, NSFAS is relegated to dealing with TVET colleges uh, for, for some reasons. Anyway... <coughs> So what was wrong with the what is wrong with the judge Heha Commission of Inquiries recommended income contingency loan model as described above? Firstly, this model has failed everywhere, particularly in the United Kingdom and uh, and the United States, leaving a trail of devastating. Uh, results on people's socio-economic well-being. In England, for example, the Institute for Fiscal Studies reported that British graduates finish with an average of about £50,000 debt and they fail to repay it even when they are given. Uh, three, three, three quarters of them fail to pay it even when they are given 30 years. What happens, as we described above, that debt is now incurred by the government. Uh, you, we must quote even from those we disagree with. So, uh, former British minister and visiting scholar at Vets Business School, uh, Lord Peter Hayne, revealed in 2017 that actually individuals or students who, were, who have had their debt written off and therefore incurred by government went from 41% in 2011 to, to 2017, I mean to 77% by 2017, which meant that all of that debt is incurred by government. So that's uh, quite the opposite of the neoliberal intention to cut government spending because one way or another the debt becomes government's problem after all. In the US you are sitting with about 1.2 trillion rand, oh, 1.2 trillion dollars of student debt that is owed by Americans. So as we can see, the income contingency loan has a history of indebting governments. So how much did the HEHA Commission believe our government would end up paying the banks if any of the scenarios which lead to the students not paying took place? Surprisingly, on page 539 uh, uh, of that report, the Commission says that figure is imponderable. I'm sorry, 
unponderable means it's not possible to tell. Of course it's possible and I'll come to that now. But that's like saying here is the most affordable car. I just don't know how much it will cost you now or later in future. And then it says in the same page or around the same page, just in case this debt becomes too much, take the 40 billion of unclaimed pensions. You know, those of parents of ours who died and, you know, were never able to claim the pensions and so on. Take that 40 billion and keep it uh, as insurance in case you need to uh, deal with the uh, growing debt burden to the banks. So almost an immediate acknowledgement that the government may actually overrun on that particular debt. I put forward that actually the cost of the recommendations of the hair report are very much uh, ponderable. From around 2000 to about 2011, when the review and uh, the NSFAS ministerial task team report on the review of NSFAS was published, it revealed that over 60% of NSFA students had actually dropped out without a qualification. If you add that to the 5% or so of unemployed graduates and the past repeat itself going forward, at least as a result of, of unemployed graduates and those who drop out without graduating, the government would owe those banks as a result of that defaulting at least 65% of that particular debt. But remember, this is not 65% of the debt owed to the banks by the poor and the working class or the missing middle is 65% of the debt <coughs> owed <coughs> to the banks by everybody, including those in private and public colleges, postgraduate, undergraduate. That's what the, the, the report actually recommended. <coughs> but of course banks are not stupid. So why would they why would they entertain such a proposal when the likelihood or the probability of defaulting on those loans is so obvious. You must ask your question, what happens when you take a loan and it's underwritten by your older brother or your uncle or your partner? When you can't pay, they go to your guarantor. Right? Now, what happens when the state defaults on that loan book? What happens when your brother defaults on that loan that you took and he underwrote, they must collect his asset. Similarly, principle number two of neoliberalism, as we described above, must then kick in. If the state can't pay the loans that it has uh, underwritten on behalf of those uh, million, I mean, almost 1.7 or so million of students, then the state must give those assets so that uh, the banks can recoup their money. I mean, that's one way of, of looking at it as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but to not waste time, let me check the time. Okay, we're still within time. But to, to rush quickly, uh, the, the commission also suggested that uh, there is evidence that there will be enough employment for graduates to be able to pay that money. Of course, we know unemployment in South Africa at the moment is in its all-time high. So that in itself was misleading. In summary, the two reports represent the embodiment of neoliberal agenda in higher education uh, through commodification and marketiz marketization. Uh, the, 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 the recommendations of those two would have entrenched the dictatorship of the markets in South Africa. Okay, let's come to the announcement of December 2017, which is the existing policy at the moment. I will run through it quickly uh, because of time. I don't think I have much time, so I'll take the next 10 minutes to conclude the presentation, this, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of that policy, as well as uh, uh, my recommendations to what I think SASCO must do. Well, firstly, the policy honors the ANC's uh, commitment to making free higher education policy, on its, both on its policy resolutions and electoral uh, manifestos. It ended the era of producing reports investigating whether free education is feasible uh, and then not implementing those recommendations. Uh, it reaffirmed education as an apex priority, particularly in light of its historic and supreme task of uh, reversing the socio-economic legacy of apartheid. Uh, uh, it, in my view, 
uh, gets us on a way to meeting the NDP target of enrolling 1.6 million students by 2030, obviously provided we expand the capacity of the higher education sector. In terms of uh, funding students, uh, the, the, the decision stopped the era of loans. You remember NSFAS was 60% loan, 40% grant in the end. So that decision did away uh, 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 with, uh, with loans, which was an exciting thing. Two, the policy extended free higher education to largely the bottom 90% that we described about, about which I don't need to repeat. Importantly, uh, that policy extended free higher education to the group of households that, whose children are currently grossly underrepresented in higher education. Uh, I mean, they, they represent about 45% of the bottom 90% uh, families. Their children make up about 45% of the university population. And uh, the, the, fam the top 10% families, their children make up the remaining 55% which is obviously unjust if you think about it. Uh, so to avoid treating an equal family equally, it excluded the top 10% families, among whom 93% of our wealth uh, uh, circulate. Firstly, a number of things makes this thing feasible. So a number of factors make that policy feasible. The first thing is that as I stated, the poor and the working class are grossly underrepresented in higher education. So you can think of it as free higher education with a transformative demand. Free higher education only for the bottom 90% whose children are grossly underrepresented. Which means the bill of the policy will go high as and when more of children from this bottom 90% are accepted into universities. And I will explain this in figures just now. You will understand, or you, you would have noticed that vice chancellors from historically black universities don't complain about um, the 350 cutoff as a new definition of which poor and working class. You know, covering children of mine workers, social grant recipients, entry level public servants, you know, uh, security guards, domestic workers, and so on. Uh, it, it covers pretty much anyone you can think of in South Africa except for those amongst whom. 93% uh, 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 of the wealth uh, circulates. Now, the reason why you see stability, or rather you don't hear those in historically black universities actually complaining is because, take Limpopo for example, 96% of Limpopo families end below that 350,000 rand. 94% of KZN families end below that. 95% of, of Mpumalanga families end below that 350,000 uh, uh, rand, right? Now, however, children of these bottom 90% families are particularly underrepresented in historically elite institutions. I'll give you an example using graduation figures. In 2016, 203,000 students graduated. Only about 26%, yeah, I think 26.4% were NSFAS graduate students. So about 53,600 students were NSFAS students. Uh, but the split is particularly interesting. Graduates who were funded by NSFAS were 77% of Mangosutu University's graduates, whereas only 65% of Stellenbosch graduates, so 65 only 6.5, I'm getting a bit exhausted maybe of talking, only 6.5% of, uh, of graduates in Stellenbosch were NSFAS funded students. While graduates, uh, NSFAS graduates made up 66% of uh, students who graduated in the University of Limpopo in 2016, only 11% of UCT's 2016 graduates were NSFAS students. I mean, I could go on, but we don't have that much time. <clears throat> but there's something which I can't skip. <clears throat> Even when the definition is expanded from 122 households to 350,000, it's still only covers less than 25% of students at VETS universities. So forget the race of the student population. 
only less than 25 percent of vet students come from the bottom 350,000 families, so the bottom 90 percent. Which means the other way of saying that is that 75 percent of vet students come from the top 10 percent earning families, amongst whom you know the wealth resides, as we discussed earlier. But <clears throat> This policy, as announced, is not uh, infallible. It is not without weaknesses. Weakness number one is that National Treasury's decision to increase VAT as a way of funding this policy was an act of class sabotage, treacherous class sabotage. There are many other ways whether it's increasing the corporate tax, wealth tax, and all other innovative ways through which you could fund the poor and the working class in higher education. They chose to use the most regressive form of taxation uh, and said to us, but don't worry, we have zero-rated tin fish. Secondly, uh, the historic debt which many students incurred as a result of NSFAS's administrative deficiencies and the practice of top slicing remains an impediment to accessing this free higher education, as I said above. So, SASCO has to make sure that all, gov all debt, all NSFAS debt, is wiped out. That's the first recommendation, I guess particularly debt owed by students to universities as a result of NSFAS's historic administrative deficiencies, top slicing, and so on. Of course, the administrative deficiencies are unforgivable. You can't possibly say, in Kenya, they use M-Pesa to transfer money using uh, uh, you know, mobile phones, and NSFAS has got billions and is struggling to distribute them in South Africa, a country with one of the most advanced uh, telecommunication systems in the continent as well as uh, 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 the financial services that they could, I mean, NSFAS could in itself become a bank and every student could carry, carry a card through which they get all of those grants. So to, those grants. So to have billions uh, uh, not being allocated to students, uh, in my view, it smells like uh, sabotage. In conclusion, there are two quotes that I've prepared for, for, for the South African Student Congress that I believe should guide the next course of action. The, the, the first quote comes from uh, William Mackenzie, who is trying to help us to answer the question, what is at stake? He says, once a nation loses control of its money and credit, it matters not who makes that country's laws. Until the issuance of currency and credit is restored to the government and recognized as its most sacred task, then all talk of sovereignty, of democracy, and of parliament is futile and idle. To come back home, Around 1944, during a National Assembly debate on the establishment of the South African Reserve Bank, an MP by the name John Christie, uh, who was a leader of the Labour Party, answered this question of what is at stake as follows. He said, what is at stake here is not how a banking system should work, but rather it's a question of who shall govern the country between democratically elected representative and private banking interests. So SASCO must never accept loans under any circumstances because by surrendering to bank loans, the youth of this country will be surrendering the national sovereignty and the national security of our country. That is a view I hold very strongly. No one born beyond 2008 should be allowed to take uh, rating agencies serious anyway. My second recommendation for SASCO is that protect higher education from market pressures. By this I mean examine the anatomy of the full cost of study. What makes up that full cost of study? At first, it costs more to eat and live in Bramfontein than to study at first. Full, a meal package and accommodation package is about 81,000 rand combined if you are eating three meals a day. 
and tuition is about 54,000 or so. If you don't deal with the issue of institutional autonomy, particularly over the determination of the full cost of study, universities' continued hiking of fees will trigger what they call the cancelling out effect. So the fees will undermine the budget you have allocated and therefore you'll fund fewer students. That's basically what I mean. So as a way forward, I suggest that SASCO lobby for the establishment of a state-owned student housing company. This company must own land for building accommodation and land for farming the food which will be eaten by students or consumed by students in those dining halls. This will drive down the cost the full cost of study, which is actually really the full cost of living while you are studying, because living costs are higher than studying costs. Uh, uh, so this state-owned student housing company, uh, I, I will look for literature on it because I think it exists somewhere like Amsterdam or something. I just need to be sure before I say that. Uh, this will protect our students from hunger and collapse the catering and dining hall cartels. Third recommendation as the Progressive Youth Alliance, and not just SASCO, the ANC Youth League Constitution says our job is to rally young people behind the banner of the ANC and to champion the interests of those young people within the ANC. I wish that we, we should remix that particular slogan because it assumes that rallying young people behind the banner of the ANC is an automatic activity. I would say the job of young people in the ANC is to hold the ANC at ransom to champion the interests of young people who are the majority of the country in order to rally them, win their confidence and rally them behind the banner of the African National Congress. That would be my view. Uh, uh, fourth recommendation, SASCO must invest in a research arm. You see, the, the, the devil is in the details. The battle on higher education requires People who will commit. I did not sleep in preparation for this lecture because I had to update my mind with the figures as well as uh, the sources of data so that I don't come here and give you my opinion but give you the true state of the country and how neoliber the neoliberal economic order relates to our higher education system through commodification or marketization. SASCO must have a, not a research manager, a research center which will become an army of intellectuals geared to protect the interests of the working class in, in an in increasingly anti-black I mean anti and anti-working class uh, university. Stop the 50-member branch in order to parade and go to conference. Every student must be a SASCO student. We must be recruiting everywhere, every day, every minute. In the bathrooms, in, in the streets, in dining halls, in dormitories, in class. SASCO must be helping with homework. After the homework, it's a membership form kind of thing. So we, our, we must be annoyingly visible. And I say we, I'm no, no longer a member because I'm no longer a student, but I very much hold SASCO in my heart. And that's why I'm using the we. You as SASCO must be annoyingly visible. That way, you'll be able to collapse the opposition that is basically non-existent, in my very strong view. Well, comrades, I could go on and on about this thing. However, to respect time, I'll stop here, pause and submit, answer some questions, and thank you very much. Mavu, ndiashu, ndiashu, mavu. Everything for the working class and nothing against them. Thank you very much. So um, I've got a different device which is supposed to have questions. I've been so focused on the camera in front of me that I haven't looked at if there are any questions. So I'll just uh, try and check here what are the questions. Uh, uh, you can also check if, the, if you are seeing any questions there. But let me go to, let me go to my other device and uh, see if there is a... Um, Questions that I could answer. Let's go to the SASCO page.
let me see. Okay, uh, I, I, I can see the, the comments. I can see the comments, but I can't see the questions. So let me switch on my phone and ask the leadership of Sasko if there are seeing any questions that I must answer uh, before I go offline. Oh, yeah. Uh, important question that I can see here. Uh, do you think there is a need to create an investment wing to fund free higher education? Uh, not just an investment wing to fund free higher education. It's, I think it's something like the National Sovereignty Fund, really. A, a fund that understands that education is part and parcel of our national sovereignty and national security architecture. So the, the, the resources that are beneath and above the South African soil must first and foremost contribute the sale of those resources, the, the beneficiation of those resources must contribute uh, 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 proceeds towards the National Sovereignty Fund. I think the president announced something similar uh, uh, recently. Uh, so you need, but you need uh, first an agreement that, you know, things like health, I'm sure health now will be, uh, it will be easy for people to understand free health care. The debate on the NHI, I'm sure it's settled now, that indeed universal health care is necessary because one person's health is now evidently linked to everybody's health. And if we are going to allow one person to, to get sick and can't get help, then that person is going to deal with everyone. So we, I'm sure by now we will understand that uh, uh, the well-being of one person is very much linked to the well-being of everybody. Uh, we have been gotten there with education, but I think health as coronavirus in one way has a positive spin in that regard. Uh, Part of our problems, yet again, is differences in fees across universities. Do you think we need to... Uh, do you think we need to standardize prices of fees? Yes, I think thorough research must go into uh, researching the anatomy of the full cost of study, as I said, and... Uh, the rationale behind those, the, the full cost of study. We had a, a, a very progressive president called Bafana Ntlapo at Vets University, and I'm not being Vets-centric. I love all Sasko Kedas. But Bafana Ntlapo started this thing. He was very meticulous at the time of going into the full cost of study in the Faculty of Engineering. When they say this is the fees, what is it for? And we, find, we found that they were also costing Googleable material as part and parcel. You know, those th they would print thick cost packs, all those kind of things. Uh, it must now be possible for SASCO's research wing to drill down into why they say tuition fee for a BCom at UCT is 61,000. <clears> they must explain that 61,000. <clears> you see, the debate is limited because South African universities operate like a monopoly. South African youth need them more than they need us. So in other countries, if you go to the UK, universities even have adverts. They're trying to get people inside. They are you know, trying to be as attractive as possible because students have options. Here in South Africa, students have no option. People's parents get killed on the queue just to get a space in late registration because the, the sector is incapacitated, as I indicated earlier. So the building of new universities and the, the innovative expansion of the sector must help us to not exclusively rely on pompous and at times very arrogant institutions that don't want to play ball with the national agenda. I mean, I saw one vice chancellor on Twitter insulting Deputy Minister Manamela. Uh, on this thing of reopening online learning and so on. And I thought this is, this is unheard of. There is no vice chancellor in any other self-respecting country 
who can tell the authority on higher education in the form of the deputy minister what is and what is not populism. But anyway, that's my response to that, Kedas. Uh, Tendo Mavi says, why academic freedom matters? Well, yes. Academic freedom and institutional autonomy or institutional freedom are two different things. Uh, let's rephrase it. Academic freedom and institutional autonomy are two different things. Academic freedom speaks to the university's ability to conduct research and teaching according to its own will. But that too is subjective because the people who run universities are human beings with subjective interpretations of reality and subjective understandings of what constitutes knowledge. So in a way, you need some form of a people's university idea where the state, civil service, um, civil servants or parents, children, uh, um, and, and, and employees all contribute towards what is taught and how it is taught. Uh, uh, so that when we say we are protecting, it's like people who say they are protecting the independence of the Reserve Bank. So the, independ the Reserve Bank is independent when it's private, privately uh, uh, owned, but not independent when it's state-owned. That is actually quite contradictory because... A, a, both the public, the, the private sector and the public sector is just as subjective on their interpretation of what ought to be an appropriate macroeconomic policy. So eco academic freedom, yes, must be preserved, but it must, be, it must not be the preserve of a few. It must extend to mean that what is taught in universities is a collective agreement of the contributions from community let me give an example that a lecturer once gave me uh, in uh, uh, one professor that I highly admire at, at, at one of the universities here at home. Uh, she said, I asked, do working class students bring any knowledge? Do they bring anything on their way here? I was doing research around the dropout rate. And she said, they bring a lot of knowledge. The question is whether we are willing to diversify what we recognize as knowledge. And I thought that was telling. So I think that should uh, guide us when we entertain this thing. Uh, Dr. Sen, uh, from Free State says, what do you think about universities as key resources of driving economic transformation through streamlining research and innovation that centers transformation, e.g. how universities serve cartels even in research and human development. How does the state make the most of our universities going forward? You know, Congress, you are being deep and broad, and I don't think I have that much time because I want to respect the time that Sasko allocated me. But let's attempt to answer uh, what you are asking. <laughs> If we agree that higher education is a public good, like say the Chinese do, and we understand that higher education is not an island that exists elsewhere and we go consult it when we want better jargon, and we understand that higher education is an investment that the country takes its scarce resources to invest in in order to see the yielding of results, then, Dr. Hussein, universities will be evaluated not by the status in the rankings, not by how internationally acclaimed they are, but how everything about them, their, their enrollment policy, their admission policy, their teaching policy, their research policy, answers critical national questions of development. Uh, Sorry for the, I don't think that jargon was necessary. Does the university deal, help us deal with food insecurity in a country that is hungry? Does the university help us deal with inequality in a country where wealth remains concentrated in the top 10%? Does, does the university help us deal with unemployment as the triple threat highlighted in the National Development Plan? If universities cannot link, cannot show us a direct link between what they are doing and what the country is battling with, I think there's a problem uh, in Dr. Said. So indeed, uh, universities must not serve dining hall and construction cartels. They must serve uh, 
communities uh, and the, the country's agenda. Can we use B, triple B, E, E dividends to fund free education? Absolutely not, in my opinion. You see, th th that recommendation exists in the Nasana uh, report. <laughs> you are going to deal with transformation in the economy because they wanted to use BEE points. Sorry, they, they wanted to say we will fund black students and that should count towards our BEE points. So they will no longer have to, tra they will no longer transform insofar as patterns of ownership and control in the economy are concerned because they will use, they, they saw students as a quick way kind of thing. So I think we must uh, demarcate it. I don't want to be deterministic and act like I've got answers to everything. But I, 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 you just reminded me of a recommendation in the Masana Ministerial Trust Team that tried to use BEE as a way of uh, doing what I said they were trying to do. Uh, let's try and scroll up. Asive Janja. Asive. One of the most pertinent threats to South Africa's promulgation of pro progressive policies would appear to be the rating agencies and related financial metrics and, and institutions, which are argued in the to inform levels of investment and domestic foreign. They're sorry levels of investments domestic and foreign in the subversion of these financial is the subversion of these financial institutions possible if so what would sa economic landscape look like in such a situation uh, professor malikane would be best suited to answer this and i think he did a lecture with sasco to try and uh, and answer this I, I, I know I did throw a little uh, jab that no one born beyond 2008 should take rating agencies serious. Uh, personally, I've never taken them serious because uh, I've, had lit I've read literature and I've seen evidence and I've seen them acknowledge to uh, politicizing ratings. But you will struggle to escape them if you continue taking debt from Bretton Woods institutions. That's why alternative financial mechanisms like the BRICS Bank and others would be a viable way to create a much more multipolar world where you can be able to dispute what Moody's say. I once stumbled into a Moody's gathering somewhere in Johannesburg and they were laughing about what is to be the next rating. <laughs> Let me maybe not talk too much. They already knew what they were going to decide. And I could just see that uh, these clowns are not serious. They are basically politicians wearing corporate suits. So, I mean, the likes of the Chinese and the Russians really laugh when they are downgraded because, uh, you know, of the balance of forces. They are much more bigger countries or economies than us. So, uh, I don't have a, 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 an, impo a, an appropriate response, uh, my brother uh, or sister, but I think it's, uh, it's, worth, uh, it's worth investigating how we can survive uh, or free ourselves from the tyranny of rating agencies. Uh, the leader of Sasko is saying, I must scroll up. Uh, the engagement is up until 3.30. Okay, so we've got 10 more minutes. How do we solve the challenges of lack of supervision capacity in higher education? for young people to pursue, pursue postgraduate studies? That question is actually very close to, to my heart. It is part of the reasons why myself, Mwimeleri, and uh, Jama, we started something called the Center for Emerging Researchers. Because, uh, in my opinion, uh, not enough attention has been given to the benefits of increasing our research and analytical capacity. It's one of the reasons why I, I, I said, uh, and I hope the President of SASCO and the Secretary General are listening uh, and are taking that recommendation serious, that they must establish a SASCO Research Center, uh, which, is, uh, which is based on um, uh, the idea of defending the interests of the working class against you know, other uh, institutions or research institutions that produce research which is aimed at undermining the interests of the working class. So yes, uh, 
uh, insofar as supervision is concerned, I think we must have a much bigger uh, discussion on that because there is racism in there, so certain professors choose to just not take up black students. There is a, a general lack of capacity in the uh, university sector, so we may need to partner with uh, universities within the continent where there is a, a greater numbers of uh, you know, professors who are willing to collaborate uh, across the continent. Um, so the supervision uh, problem is actually uh, very big. Um, and um, I think uh, Sasko, I'll speak to the comrades from Sasko because I've written something on it and maybe we can publish it alongside the notes that I'll publish on this. Uh, uh, someone is asking if universities do receive money for when they produce postgraduates. Uh, yes, you are correct. You are correct. Um, let's keep going. Uh, I think the, as part of your presentation, you mentioned that the cost of living at tertiary in, uh, is higher than fees. What sort of state intervention can create equality? When, before we even creating equality, I think the state must preserve or protect higher education from market pressures. So the idea that it's something that must be bought and sold, must be thrown out of the window, and it must be seen as a worthwhile investment with long-term cultural, political, and economic returns. So land must be freed to build student accommodation for poor and working class students. And uh, uh, so the, the more student accommodation is built by the government at obviously a controlled rate, it will drop prices. So the south points of this world will no longer be able to hike their prices to where they are hiking them at now. So I remember I gave you an example of VET's full cost of study. About 81,000 is for food and accommodation and about 50 something thousand is for the BCOM tuition. The, the BCOM one, I'm not saying we must accept. That too we must interrogate as Bafana once did. Uh, but the one of student, I mean, of the living cost ought to be investigated. And um, I think uh, a state-owned student housing company is one of the solutions. I'm sure some of you will think of other solutions as well on how. So basically, we simply need to go and look at what the universities must open their books and tell us uh, uh, what goes into this amount. Uh, is it electricity bill? Can we have a discussion with ESCOM to exempt universities from the electricity bill and therefore drop the cost of tuition in its own? Uh, is it a water bill? Uh, let's deal with uh, let's find a way of dealing with the water issue what other bill is it rates and taxes well maybe the cities must stop that kind of thing i'm saying let's investigate the anatomy of the full cost of study so that we don't allow university fees to cancel out the increased investment because each time government increases money you know when you are playing with a child uh, you say hit here when she jumps you say no no hit here when she jumps, you say, no, 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 hit here. So as a result of that, uh, if the universities are allowed to, to ramp up fees as they see fit, it will end up undermining the greater investment that we're demanding should be made in higher education. So some kind of uh, conversation must go into uh, what really goes into the full cost of study and what can we do to undermine that, hiking, uh, that cost hiking. Uh, what do I think of the migration online? I think Sasko is going to have this discussion with someone else. Uh, I, so I'll leave it for that. Uh, but basically at the moment, uh, it will only reproduce inequality. I mean, it, if you see how universities chase the students from their residences and sending them home in the middle of a pandemic, sending them exactly where they won't have access to, to online learning. And then you say you'll send them laptops. That's all. I, I'm sorry, I don't buy that the universities are prepared for this uh, online learning. Of course, the online learning is not a very bad idea. It's a great resource that will be able to help us even in times like, such as this where matters are beyond our control. But at the moment, I think it is reckless to just resume classes just like that 
are you going to fail people who are unable to learn online because they'll say, sorry, when I paid, I was paying for contact learning. Why are you now reducing me to a UNISA arrangement? And if you are reducing us to a UNISA arrangement, are you going to half the fees like UNISA now? Because we are not having contact uh, uh, lessons. So, so the economics of it must be investigated. Because really, I think uh, it's unacceptable to just decide we will reopen just like this. Uh, without taking into consideration that you actually chased people away from cities to the villages. And now you are saying they must access. Some of them don't even have uh, coverage. So it doesn't matter which, da which data you send them. Uh, mm, uh, let's see. I think I can take one more question. I'm trying to. I'm sorry. I'm ramping very fast because I have to respect the time. Uh, Okay, I think uh, most of them I have already um, responded to. So I guess it's time for me to, to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, to thank uh, the South African Student Congress, to, to thank all structures of SASCO and the Progressive Youth Alliance for the invitation and for, for engaging in this uh, dynamic uh, topic. Uh, what I wish to, to emphasize is that um, uh, this, this particular uh, fight uh, is not for us, it's for our own children. So we can't afford to drop the ball now. Uh, but other than that, uh, thank you so much. Thank you to, to the Secretary General, the National Working Committee, the NEC and the President of SASCO for the invitation. I hope it was not a complete waste of your time. Thank you very much.